سو بسم اللہ الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علیہ سید المرسلین محمد الامین اما بعد سو ٹوڈے آئی مین ٹو ٹیل یو سم تھنگ آئی مین ٹیل یو فیو تھنگس بٹ آئی مین ٹو کانسنٹریٹ آن ون پرٹیکولر تھنگ اینڈ دیٹ شوڈ میک یو کرائی اینڈ کرائی اینڈ کرائی کرائی آؤٹ یور آئیز ٹوڈے آفٹر آئی ٹیل یو بیکاز ون آئی ایم اباؤٹ ٹو ٹیل یو یو نوٹ گن اے بلیو بٹ آئی مین ٹو ٹیل یو سم تھنگس دیٹ یو آلریڈی نو to start with and then there's one big question that I will answer inshallah which I'll tell you what that is but what I'm about to tell you today is going to shock you it's going to really really shock you it's going to make you think okay where are we going and that's what sh- is shocking me that where are we going but let's start with something very small and then I'll build up to what's happening in this hajj in juma in the in the khutbah al hajj in the khutbah of hajj who is giving this hajj the person who is giving this khutbah of hajj is a complete sell out and i'm not even joking i'm not like you know out to call this person kafir and this person's kafir astaghfirullah no but there's seriously things going in the wrong direction that force a person to say things that they would never say And so let me start at the very basic point okay very basic something very basic Assalamu alaikum bikum bada mawsim Jeddah fi al-raqs wal-ghina wal-iftitahiyat al-jamila This is happening in Jeddah just close to Mecca right Muslims in Jeddah dancing and notice what this person says watch Tahbina nitsharak nahna wa iyyakum bi hadhihi al-iftitahiyah min mawsim Jeddah Notice this is Jeddah where men and women were always separated right to the extreme level now men and women dancing together let's continue افتتاحي بدون موسيقى طبعا كان في موسيقى ولكن ما حطينا هذه الموسيقى اصلا موسيقى لان الموسيقى الان تنتشر في السعوديه اكثر من القران What did he just say? Music is now played in Saudi Arabia. Music is now played in Saudi Arabia akthar min al-Qur'an, more than Qur'an. The days of Qur'an being recited in Saudi Arabia are gone. Now it's all dance and play. But you would think this is bad news. No, this is expected. The bad news I'm going to give you. So the person to give the the khutbah of hajj deliver the hajj khutbah this year is this man muhammad bin abdul karim al isa this man i will let you decide about him i will let you decide what status we should give this person as a leader of the muslims oh don't don't worry he has a lot of credentials for sure He is uh, the, you know, the appointed, appointed khatib of Hajj of 1423 by King Salman bin Abdul Aziz. He will deliver the Hajj khutbah on Friday, okay? And, uh, you know, he is uh, in charge of many Muslim organizations, including uh, Rabit al-Islamiyah. He is the general sec- uh, Secretary General of the Muslim World League, a Mecca-based non-profit organization representing Muslims worldwide. and you know he has many international rewards which some of them i will be showing to you what they are but this is the man who's giving the 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 khutbah of juma for hajj he's giving the hajj khutbah okay so now let me tell you about him as you know the arab world has been inviting these uh, indian actors and singers and bollywood and doing all their thing that they do one of the people that they've been inviting is their gurus right they're 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 religious leaders okay now one of the people that was invited he had this to say now this person hates islam like you know what's happening in india 
when they're not allowing Muslims to wear hijab and all that. So now he hates Muslims, and this is what this brother is talking about. Now this brother, who's giving the Hajj khutbah on Friday, right? He is in alliance with this Hindu man. He's in alliance, and this is a Jewish reward he's been given by Jewish people, which I'm going to talk about in some detail. So the, this is the person that's giving the Hajj khutbah this year. But you would think that's enough to cry. It's enough to cry that what's happening to Arabia, that they're dancing more than they're reading Quran. That's a reason to cry. The fact this man is giving the Hajj khutbah is a reason to cry. But that's not the worst of what has already occurred, which I will talk about in a little bit. He was given, and he's saying this, he's been given that award because of his statement regarding the Holocaust. Because he went to the Holocaust, which I'll show you the pictures. He went, to, this person who was giving the Hajj khutbah on Friday went to the Holocaust to say, shame on Muslims who are Holocaust deniers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be saying a lot of things. But this man, this Hindu guy who was invited to Arabia, right? What are his beliefs? His beliefs are like this. So this guy, he basically is a mulhid. He's an atheist. He hates Muslims and the Muslims and Islam. Because you're a believer, not just in God, in so many other things. The most sensible way to start your life is, what I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Once you come to this sincerely, you will see your knowing will constantly go on expanding on a daily basis. Otherwise, the moment you believe, you are stagnant. Belief is death, actually. Marx said, is the opium. Religion is the opium. Because it puts people to sleep. He's very right. It's put people to sleep, isn't it? Isn't it? Sleep is comfortable. What's wrong with it? Why sleep? Why don't you die? It is even more comfortable. Do you know that? Because anyway, you're a believer. After all, your God is waiting. Why don't you go? Yes, isn't it? <laughs> Because anyway, you know, when you die, you'll go to God. What is the problem? Why are you waiting, going to this hospital, all this nonsense? Why don't you go? Why are you delaying your progress towards God? That's not right. You're not a true believer. <laughs> so, this is the person that the person who is giving the Hajj khutbah this year has an alliance with, okay? And in the name of perennialism, in the name of all religions are the same. We love the Jews. They're our cousins. They're our brothers. I'm going to show you all that. Don't worry. Now, what is, I'll mention this. Now, these people, all of these secular Muslims, this is what they are. They're secular Muslims. And I, I don't know if I should, what I should call a secular Muslim other than at least he's a fasik. But the Quran says a secular Muslim is a kafir. Whoever doesn't rule by the book of Allah, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whoever does not rule by the book of Allah, he's kafir. But what does this person say? Political Islam is bad. That Islam that wants khilafah, that Islam that wants its autonomy, that Islam that wants to have its own power for the good, for the means of bringing good to humanity, that is bad. So when he's interviewed here in France, he's told the president of France thinks it's political Islam, meaning the Islam that wants Khilafah, the Islam that wants its own judicial, political, economic, social order, the just social system of Islam, so that it can be established, so people can see the difference between a satanic, unnatural way of life and the natural way of life Islam gives, if that is established, he's against that. He's against political Islam. So, now, what does he say? 
لا مكان للاسلام السياسي في باريس. نعم لا مكان للاسلام السياسي في اي مكان في باريس. There is no, he says. There's no place for political Islam in France or anywhere else. No wonder he's been allowed to speak for the Hajj of 2022. Because he is the, uh, you know, he's the pet, pet of the king. And he's going to kiss his butt and say, yeah, we don't want political Islam. Because political Islam means what? You have to be against the kingship. You have to speak against the monarchy and against all their dhulm. So you don't want any political Islam. You want what? Well, you want a religion called Islam? Just only some aspects of Islam? So what does he say? It does not abide by values. It does not abide the national values of any country. So this man who's going to give the Jummah khutbah in a time where what? It's supposed to show unity of all Muslims. Unity of all the Muslims. What is his message? His, his belief is that no, every Muslim country is, is its own Muslim country. And you have to abide by your constitution and your national laws. And therefore, he is a man who is against the spirit of Hajj. Because Hajj is the spirit of one humanity under one God. And this guy wants every, uh, all the Hujjaj are according to that, you know, it, 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 it uh, Basically accepts nationalism by their national values of any country. So let me hear, let you hear what he says. There is no place for political Islam in France or anywhere else because it does not abide by values of our religion or by the national values of any country. So having Khilafah is against the religion, our religion. Are you like foolish? Nor does it respect the laws and constitution of countries. So if we bring Islam as a, as a, as a sphere of space of living, that means that Islam does not appreciate other people. Are you like, have you lost your mind? Okay. It's political background and strives to accomplish a certain political agenda. Like as if the West and Israel and other countries don't strive for their political agenda. Are you like so nonsensical? Are you like, you're like, you're foolish. You're like really foolish. Because every people, every civilization has its agendas. That's just inevitable. And this is, anyway. You must respect the constitution. As long as you can live in a certain land. This is what he says. So if the, all the laws of the constitution are against Islam, you must respect that. This is the person who is doing your Hajj khutbah in Mecca this year. So cry. Cry. He said, if you don't like that, then go choose your own nation to live in if you don't like it. So this man who's doing Hajj, giving the Hajj khutbah this year and doing the the khutbah of Hajj this year on Friday. So I heard this conversation of his, and I'm going to point out to you his very big mistake practically that he's been doing. Now, I haven't shown you anything that he's actually done yet, which I'm going to do in a little bit, which you'll see why I'm so angry, which is why I'm going to, I'm saying that, you know, cry your eyes out. It's okay. We deserve it. Over here, he's talking about dialogue with others and amongst Muslims and non-Muslims and, and, and others, right? So dialogue in general. And what does he say? He says here, I don't want to go over the whole thing. Uh, he says, look, don't make the dialogue about one thing. Just be open about dialogue with all the secondary and tertiary possibilities that can exist, right? I'm going to let you listen to him for one or two minutes, and then I'm going to tell you the problem with what he's saying. So you say that people come to conversations or dialogues with only one goal. And what does that mean? And that is 
Muslims come to the table with only one thing. That is that I am on the truth and you're on the falsehood. And you must be defeated because the truth is with me. Of course, the truth has to be clarified. We don't disagree about that. Don't think about dialogue that if they are not on your way of belief and your way, then you have lost uh, the purpose of the dialogue. By adopting this methodology, other objectives of the dialogue are lost. Now, that's a very logical point. Okay, but here's the problem, as you will see. And please remember this as I show you other videos of his. Yes, we want dialogue. And even if it achieves a little bit, we want dialogue. We want dialogue with the Christians and the Jews and Hindus. No Muslim will be ever against that. But in any of these dialogues, did you ever raise your issues? Or you only raised their issues? I'm going to make this clear as I show you the other videos. Because if you have raised your issues, okay, what are you doing for the Palestinian people? Or are you going to take tours to their uh, places of Holocaust and sign documents and show how much you are loving of them and kissing their butt? And if that's the only, that's your dialogue? That's your dialogue? That Dialogue means you bring nothing from your side and you accept everything from their side? Well, let's see if this person did that and then you can decide, okay? Now, about his interfaith work, okay, so here is, for example, he's meeting the Pope, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with meeting the Pope. You know, he's a Muslim leader. Supposedly, he can meet the Pope. You know, great, good for him. I'd like to meet the Pope, too. So you get the point, right? There's nothing more. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of the type of person he is. It's going to get worse, okay? Thanks to the extraordinary, bold, and courageous statements and leadership of Sheikh Dr. Alisa, we see that it is possible again for Jews and Muslims to be natural allies. This is the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. They're saying, if they're saying this about some Muslim, just think about what does it mean for this person to be giving Juma khutbah or the, the, Friday, the Hajj khutbah. Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Ali Saab, Secretary General of the Muslim World League and former Minister of Justice of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is the most prominent voice of moderate Islam today, devoting himself to reconciliation between religions, speaking out to reject Holocaust denial, while combating anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all forms of religious hatred. Sheikh Dr. Alisa's relationship with the Jewish community has been built on mutual respect and positive action. In November 2017, Sheikh Dr. Alisa visited the Paris Grand Synagogue. In January 2018, for the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, Sheikh Dr. Alisa sent a letter to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum sharing his sympathy with the victims of the Holocaust and condemning its denial. And this is where I said, did he, he wrote that letter. Very good. It's good. He wrote that letter. If he wants to, he can write that letter. I don't have a problem. My problem is you catered to them and their needs. And you catered to their egos and their desires. Did you say anything about what they're doing wrong or what they shouldn't be doing or how they should be treating the Palestinian Muslims? No, you didn't. You just Lick their boots. That's all you did. Later, he visited and joined an event at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, featuring representatives of Muslim countries that saved or protected Jews during the Holocaust. In this event, Sheikh Dr. Isa said, We should carry on with dialogue, and we should never listen to the voices of hatred and exclusion. That same month, he visited the American Sephardi Federation at the center. By the way, you see the American Sephardi Federation, you see that hand, the hand symbol? That hand symbol is a symbol of Satanism, by the way. It's one of the, the occult symbols, okay? And so what is he doing with the American Sephardic Association 
people that belong to this symbol. And uh, I, let me just show you this very quick. This thing inside the hand, sometimes called the hand of Fatima and has different names, but this is all occult stuff. And they always put the eye in the middle, right? So the you see the eye in the middle, right? Okay, now let me show you. So in this case, instead of the eye, they have the stars in the middle, right? The same concept. History. After the atrocity at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue, he issued the Muslim War of Week's first ever condemnation of an anti-Semitic terrorist attack. In 2018, Sheikh Dr. Alisa visited the Park East Synagogue and signed an agreement with the Appeal of Conscience Foundation, calling for the protection of religious sites around the world. The Sheikh with the American Sephardi Federation toured New York's Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, Sharif Israel, the birthplace of the American Jewish community. On Yom Shoah 2019, Sheikh Dr. Alisa signed the historic It Stops Now agreement against hate, bigotry, and fanaticism, together with the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations and the American Sephardi Federation. The agreement reads in part, Hatred against anyone is a threat to everyone. It stops now. The Sheikh... Hatred the against anyone. Yet, you didn't... It, it, you know, you're putting all the onus on the Muslims. Yet what? You don't talk about Palestine. You talk, don't talk about Muslim issues. You don't talk truth to power. And as long as you are a scholar of that caliber, and you never spoke truth to power, to me, you're, you're the problem. Anyone who is against Khilafah is the problem. Anyone who is against Muslims, uh, their autonomy, their establishment of Khilafah, anyone who is into this whole, uh, you know, this whole uh, craze of interfaith, uh, interfaith, uh, interfaith insanity, interfaith insanity, where you are just like, oh, you're good and I'm good and we're all good and you know what? You have your truth, I got my truth. You like me, I like you. This is the real thing. This is humanism. No, that doesn't go. It doesn't go down like that, right? And so, this is he's the problem, and he's the one who's giving the. And but this is not the worst. I have the worst for you to cry about to still show you. Okay, this is not the worst. The Muslim World League and American Jewish Committee's historic visit of Muslim leaders to Auschwitz to commemorate the 75th anniversary. So he praised the Salah in the Auschwitz uh, where the Jewish people were uh, killed, right? But did he ever say that let's not also do a Holocaust of the Muslims? Of its liberation. There he said, God frustrated Nazi plans and they met the most horrible defeat. They went down in history as the scum of their era, but some st And dare I say that you will also go down as a scum. Still bemoan their defeat today. These people share a common hatred of Jews and Muslims. In May 2020, in a powerful interview with a Jewish writer in the Arab News, Sheikh Dr. Alisa declared, We as Muslims respect, love, understand, cooperate, coexist, and tolerate everyone. With our Jewish brothers, we concluded agreements and mutual cooperation, and we love them and respect them greatly. The Combat Anti-Semitism Movement and the American Sephardi Federation commend Sheikh Dr. Mohammed bin Abdul Karim Al Isa for his courageous and outstanding contributions towards countering extremism, building bridges of understanding, and combating anti-Semitism. So you think that would be the end of it, right? Now let me show you. And again, he goes to the Washington Institute of Near East Studies, right? What does he say there? Again, he talks about the Holocaust and how bad it was and how, how much it hurt him and how much he felt the pain of the Jewish people being killed in the Holocaust. He should because he's a human being and he should feel the pain of all human beings. But he only feels the pain of the Jewish people. He never brought up the pain of the Muslims. <laughs> عن هذه الحادثة وذكرني باحتفالها أو ذكراها السنوية الحقيقة أن هذه الذكرى المؤلمة درسنا عنها في الصغر He said, you know, we studied about the, uh, the Holocaust when we were small and وكانت دراستنا عنها متجردة وعادلة 
وكنا ننظر إلى هذه القضية بالنظر الوثائقي الذي يسرد التاريخ بوثائقه وكانت عندنا من الصغر حقائق تاريخية عن هذه الفاجعة الإنسانية التي هزت الكيان الإنساني وأصابت الإنسانية بوصمة عاق And he's talking about how the humanity was hit by great shame and how he was shook studying about the Holocaust when he was small كبيرة جدا الحقيقة هذه وصمة استمرت عند And then he says the truth is that it is a stain that continued among those who still deny this episode meaning the Holocaust No one, by the way, denies the Holocaust. What they deny is the numbers of the people killed in the Holocaust. But, you know, I'm not a historian to be able to debate that. And that's not the point. The point is, if you're a negotiator on behalf of the Muslims, why are you just licking their boots? Why don't you talk about Islam? Why don't you talk about what's happening with the Muslims? You're inviting Hindus who are atheists. You're, you're having all these dialogues with the Jewish people, calling them your brothers. But never during this whole time did you ever, ever bring up Islamic issues or Muslim issues. Right? So, let's just continue now. Thank you for your attention. Act with conviction and not with convenience. Powerful words from Sheikh Dr. Muhammad al Isa, and extremely relevant ones for this particular moment in history when we're coming together to talk. And just one more thing of many that stood out to me that I have to mention is this question that Sheikh Dr. al Isa says. He asks every Jewish leader, How can I help in your fight against religious hatred? I think that's something that not only leaders and communities can learn from, but also individuals watching. Well, if you've just joined us, you're watching this live event, really an event that's one of its kind, the first ever combat anti-Semitism award bestowed on Muslim leaders fighting against anti-Semitism. We've, of course, just heard honoree Sheikh Dr. Elisa, our distinguished speakers, as you see them with us from all around the world. And you can always catch the full program in case you miss any of it later on campus, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. But And then this Sheikh talking to the Jewish organization says this to them. I would like to commend you for your tireless work and dedication in an effort to rebuild positive Muslim Jewish relations. This is a testament to the strong ideals of the American Jewish Committee. He's thanking the Jewish people for trying to reach out to the Muslims and their tireless work that they have done to create good relationships with the Muslims. Have you gone mad? Have you gone mad? Do you know anything about American politics or politics in the world? What have, has the American Jewish com Committee done anything about the Palestinians? So, this is the person who's giving your Juma khutbah, this Hajj. And what does he think about the Saudi government, the one that's allowing him to give this khutbah? He says what about the Saudi government and its leadership? At the forefront of this is this kingdom of Saudi Arabia. An entrepreneur and effective leadership. So he's talking about conferences held in Mecca uh, of Arabia, thanks to the leadership again. So Khadim al Karima of Khadim al Harami. The, under the generous care of the custodian of the two holy mosques and his highness the crown prince may God protect them Muslim World League Secretary General Dr. Muhammad Al-Isa and the American Jewish Committee CEO David Harris led on Thursday a groundbreaking joint visit of Muslims and Jews in Otsowitz the infamous Nazi German death camp.
and here he is at Auschwitz. Uh, you know, of course, getting the pat on the back by the Jewish uh, people. So how far does this person go? Well, I'll tell you. Here's a Jerusalem Post article. I went to Medina as a Jew. Biden should go to opinion. Uh, I'll read the first paragraph. In the and this is the part that should make you cry. This is the part that should make you cry. And I'm going to clarify this question. Are non-Muslims allowed in Mecca, Medina? What are the different opinions on this issue? And are they allowed in Arabia? And what is the Islamic point of view on this issue? Okay, I'm going to talk about that towards the end. The, um, so now, uh, on the road to Medina, Saudi officials recently removed signs reading Muslims only. I saw that actually. And last month, a delegation of 50 Jewish business leaders closely affiliated with Israel. Let me repeat this. Closely affiliated with Israel visited the mosques, the Prophet's mosque, Al-Masjid Al-Nabwi, in Medina as part of a visit meant to promote mutual understanding. So it starts with these dialogues that you're seeing with this uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al-Asi or Al-Isa in Medina as part of a visit meant to promote mutual understanding and respect and tolerance. Okay, the delegation comprised of from 13 countries. Okay, and it goes on and on. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you should cry your eyes out that the day has come where 50, a delegation of 50 Jewish people go to Medina after 1,300 years. A group of people go to Medina after and that doesn't mean that there weren't Jews in the time of Umar bin Khattab. I'm going to explain that, okay? The the fiqhi aspect of that. But generally speaking, after 1,300 years, after 1,300 years, 350 years, 370 years, Jews have now gone back to Medina as business leaders and as tourists and as delegations of business meant to promote mutual understanding, respect, and tolerance. For who? For who? Do they have more tolerance for us? Or is it that we're being made to have more tolerance for them? Now let me show you the next part. Ibn Muqaddma said, who is a great uh, Hanbali scholar, it is not permissible for any of them, the kuffar, to live in Hajjaz. Now some people, Muslims may object to this, that why can't we let non-Muslims come here and, you know, well, the answer is simple. Muslims cannot go to the Vatican. And the Muslims would not be allowed into the Jewish temple, would they? Can anyone just go into the White House? Can anyone just go anywhere? So there is a sense of sacredness of a space and there is a sense of security for that space. So let's now continue. Having said that, it is not permissible for any of them to live in Hijaz. You can't live there. This is the view of Malik and Ashafi, but Malik said, I think they should be expelled from all the Arab lands because the Messenger of Allah said two religions cannot coexist in Arabian Peninsula. Meaning the Prophet said that Islam will only exist in Arabian Peninsula. Because everything needs a quarter, a headquarter, a foundation. And so foundation of Islam, as put by the Prophet, was Arabia. Abu Dawud narrated with his asnad there, Umar, that he heard from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu say, I will certainly expel the Jews and Christians from Arabia, Arabian Peninsula. And I will not give anyone there, uh, anyone there, uh, but I will not leave anyone there but Muslims. Tirmazi said, this is Sayy Hasan Hadith. It was narrated by Ibn Abbas, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, left behind three instructions. Expel the Mushrikeen from Arabia, meaning the pagans, who now these people are bringing through those Hindu. Honor the delegations the way I do, meaning if a delegation comes, it's okay. And he kept quiet about the third, narrated Abu Dawud. Secondly, is it permissible to enter Medina for purpose of trade without staying there? They should be given enough time to complete 
then they should be told to leave. Ibn Muqadma said, It is permissible for them to enter the Hijaz for purposes of trade, because Christians used to trade with Medina in the time of Umar radiallahu anh. An old Christian came to him, meaning Umar, in Medina and said, I'm an old Christian man and your agent has taken the tith for me twice, meaning he's taken the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the khuruj, the kharij twice. Umar said, I'm an old monotheist. And Umar wrote to the agent and said, only take the tith once in a year. Okay, meaning the, the, the kharaj, the tax. Do not allow him to stay for more than three days. This is what was narrated for Umar radiallahu anh, and they should leave after that. Al-Qadi said four days is the limit after which a traveler must offer prayers in full. Thirdly, we have mentioned about Medina and its security does not apply. We have mentioned about Medina and its sanctuary does not apply to sanctuary of Mecca. The kuffar are forbidden to enter it under any circumstances, meaning Mecca. But they can enter Medina for trade purposes. It says in uh, one of the fiqhi books, the majority of the scholars, including Muhammad bin Hassan, among the Hanafis, there are, they are of the view that it is not permissible for the kuffar to enter the sanctuary of Mecca at all. The view of the Hanafis is that it is permissible for there to be a treaty or if there is, is a, if there is a treaty or have been given permission. With regard to the sanctuary of Medina, it is not forbidden for them to enter and bring a message or trade to bring some goods. A kafir may not enter other parts of the Arab lands without permission or treaty. The Fuqa have discussed this matter in detail, and Allah knows best. So now here is the issue. So is it a problem that 50 people came to Medina uh, for a few days? Uh, I think it was more than three days. But is it a problem? The problem is not that uh, you're doing this out of some goodwill. You're doing this out of a political agenda of yours. And what is more problematic is this. As this website, Five Pillars, mentions. 50 what? Pro-Israel Jewish business leaders visited the Prophet's mosque in Medina. Let me repeat that. 50 pro-Israelis. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to help you understand this. Okay, what does it mean, 50 pro-Israelis? Now, let me show you the really dangerous part. Really, the Dijal that wants to enter Mecca and Medina part. So, you see this picture? First of all, there's the Saudi family here, as you see in this picture, and it says what? Al Saud, the family of Saud, Shajaratul Mal'unata, the cursed tree, meaning the Saudi family is the cursed tree. And over here, you have one person from the Saudi family, the royal family, and the person in the green who is a Jewish man wearing what Jewish teflon? Now, let me tell you what that Jewish teflon is, and then you'll understand where this is all going. A tweeted composite picture that showed at left a picture of Israeli Jew, Jew Ben Zin, wearing green inside the mosque of the Prophet. So now notice, he's inside Masjid an nabvi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wearing his Jewish symbols, which would be haram for Muslim to allow that. At the right, the Saudi family with the words, Cur the cursed tree of the, the cursed, uh, uh, the cursed Saudi tree. Now, when a Jew enters the Masjid of the Prophet and they are, this is even before this event, by the way, but when this person enters the Medina with the Jewish Teflins, how many of the Muslims know what that means? Let me explain to you what that means. The Jewish Teflin is a box that they put on their forehead and on their arms. It's a cube like the Kaaba. Why? Because they have the desire and they have talked about this okay that they want to do the pilgrimage to Mecca they want to do the pilgrimage to the Kaaba because they believe that Musa والسلام, was going to take them to the Kaaba and this is what the Jews in Medina were waiting for too that when their prophet comes he will fight with the Arabs and give them access to the Kaaba okay and so now let me show you this book written by the Jewish man, rabbi, whatever, returned to Mecca. What does he have over here? A Jewish Teflon. Okay. And A.V. Lipkin wrote this book 
And what is it called? Return to Mecca. Who's talking about return to Mecca? The Jewish people. Now let me share this with you. Mecca. What what could that possibly mean? And and on the <coughs> cover is a picture of a black cube. That's where the story starts. Avi, let's let's start right there. Yes. Um I believe that the Bible is a GPS. Uh I believe that the Bible uh took place, a lot of it took place in Arabia. Actually, in most churches, Christians say to me, we know that Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai, is not in the Sinai Peninsula, but rather in northwest Saudi Arabia. It's called Jebel al Laws. Uh, I'm the first Jew in the Jewish world who's coming to the rabbis and saying, the Torah is a GPS. Uh, Jethro, the high priest of Midian, I believe is the high priest of the Kaaba, the black stone which is today in Mecca. There was no Mecca. It was just a black stone in those days. Our father's Jethro. He's Sheik of Midian. Uh, Moses was the son-in-law of Jethro. Moses was the understudy of Jethro for 40 years. And when Moses went to take the children of Israel out of slavery, he gave them the phylacteries, which they are to put on their forehead and on their left arm, as a sign from God that we are leaving the pyramid system of slavery in Egypt, and we're going to the cube system of freedom in Arabia. And it must be remembered that there was no Judaism in those days. There was no Christianity. There was no Islam. All people, including the Israelite slaves, were pagans. And, of course, the golden calf, basically the children of Israel reverted to the gods that they had known in Egypt yes. when Moses delayed coming back. So the purpose of this book is to show where exactly we were and that 38 years at least of the uh, exodus was in Arabia uh, Moses, Aaron Jethro were at the Kaaba which is today Mecca and when God says in Deuteronomy 11 that the borders of Israel will include the desert to the south, that desert is Arabia Jethro was uh, a cousin because Jethro's descended from Midian. Uh, Midian was one of the brothers of, of Isaac. So you have uh, Ishmael, son of Hagar, and then you have the children of Keturah. So Midian is one of the children of Keturah. And uh, from Midian, you go down to the next generation, which is Reuel or Raguel. And one of the names of uh, Jethro in the Bible is Reuel. So he was probably in the Middle East, many times people are named after grandfathers and great grandfathers. We've come far from Egypt, across the desert, on foot. He who has no name surely guided your steps. No name. You Bedouins know the God of Abraham? Abraham is the father of many nations. We are the children of Ishmael, his firstborn. We are the obedient of God. I, I will dwell in this land. So Moses, when he had to flee Egypt after he killed the, the taskmaster who was beating the Jewish slave, the Israelite slave, he knew where he was going. He knew the geography. He was almost Pharaoh. So he had to know the geography. So he took the Israelites through the desert to what is today Nueva, on the eastern shore of the Red Sea of uh, yeah, Sinai. That is where they crossed. And there's, by the way, there's no archaeological proof at all of an exodus in the Sinai Peninsula. The, but there is tons of archaeological proof in the Arabian Peninsula, the New Testament, uh, chapter 4, verse 25 of Galatians. It says, you know, that Mount Sinai and Hagar, which are in Arabia. Josephus speaks very clearly that uh, Sinai, uh, that the Ishmaelites are there, the Troglodytes are there, uh, the children of Keturah are there. The children of Esau are there. Everybody is there, and they're all one family. They talk about the linkage between the, the Jews who wear phylacteries and this pilgrimage to Mecca. By the way, if Christians have ever come to Israel, so I'm talking now to the people who have been to Israel, they've seen it on the flight. Yes. Because when, 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 when people are still snoozing, and the sun comes up as the plane is approaching Israel, 
you see the Orthodox Jewish men go to the back of the plate and they pray, and they put on the phylacteries. And this is a tradition that goes back 3,500 years. Phylacteries is the thing that, the square that they put, the Kaaba, that they put on their head. Uh, by the way, it, very important, and I learned this in the Jewish Theological Seminary, we studied the New Testament. Matthew 23, verse 5. Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees, and he says, For all their, their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and they enlarge the hems of their garment, or the tzitzit on their prayer shawls. And it's, it's interesting, indeed, that today there are three types of phylactery. You have the size A, the size B, and the size C. And so what Jesus was saying was, he wasn't saying don't put on the phylacteries, which I'm sure Jesus did. Uh, what he was saying was that if you have the $200 phylactery, you have the $400 phylactery, you have the $600 phylactery, which is the humongous, don't spend your money on $600 phylacteries, spend it on the 200 and give the 400 charity to feed the poor. It was so, But it's something, it's in Matthew 23, verse 5. So we know that Jewish men in those days wore this. We know that in the Greek Orthodox Christian tradition, there are priests who put on phylacteries. It's a slightly different Greek phylactery, but it all commemorates exactly the same thing. So the phylacteries have a very important meaning for Christians as well. So my question, and I'll ask it for everybody who's watching, why in the world would you put on, uh, strap a little wooden box with the scriptures from Deuteronomy on the inside and attach that to your left arm and to your forehead? Why would, why would you do that, and why would it be cube-shaped, cube perfectly cube-shaped? And so the contention in my book is that when Moses came to Pharaoh, and fa remember, Pharaoh's God, Pharaoh was God in Egypt, denial, and he created this, and he created that. And who's Moses? Moses is a guy who stutters. It's very hard to talk. And God says, give the people a sign. And the phylacteries were the sign. He gave Pharaoh the signs. You remember his rod became a uh, crocodile or serpent, ate the other crocodiles. Right. Or serpent. And uh, the, the, the leprosy in the chest. These are all signs. That, and then later the ten plagues. Um, and Moses gave signs to the elders of Israel. And Moses gave signs to the people. You're talking about primitive pagan people who are shepherds. And they're saying to Moses, well, why should we listen to you? You know, and so, so this uh, phylactery has four pouches, four parchments. Uh, the first two are Exodus 13. Then you have Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. So this Gatba thing they put on their head has four passages. Exodus 13, we are still in Egypt. We are still in slavery. We're about to flee. But Exodus 13 talks about the, you know, sign on thy arm and frontless between thine eyes. And, I, you know, I know young people won't know the word that I'm going to say now, but there's a word that older people like you and I remember, which is, you know, you know gyroscope. A gyroscope takes us directly in the direction we have to go. And Moses is leading the children of Israel out of the pyramid triangular system to the cubic square system of freedom in the desert. And again, uh, Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may circle me in the desert. The other five times, let my people go so that they may serve the Lord in the desert. But the first one is they should go around the circles. Now, Hajj is a pilgrim to Mecca. Hag is the Egyptian pronunciation. Hag in Hebrew means a holiday or going around in circles. May hold a feast, but this word feast is hajj, unto me in the wilderness. So where is all this going? I'll tell you where all this is going. The brother who is giving the khutbah, the fasiq, why is he a fasik? He's a fasik because he does not believe in the supremacy of the Sharia law on the land. And he's not willing to say that the Khilafah is, has to be established. He wants to serve the king, okay? So let him serve his king. But his khutbah, the khutbah he's going to give, the person giving the khutbah is a fasik. That I'm very clear of. If not, more than that. Now, <clears throat> and then I showed you how he's He's cozy with all the Jewish movers and shakers. He's cozy with the Pope, right? 
he's cozy with the king of uh, Saudi Arabia. He believes in peace. Peace at the cost of Muslim lives. He never once spoke out for justice for Muslims. He wants to talk about peace and not justice. And the Quran tells us this about people that talk about peace. And, and they're, they're, when it is said to them, don't cause corruption in the world. No, we're peacemakers. Why are you talking about establishment of Islam and bringing all these things that are not according to the sentiments of the modern mind and the modern man? No. This man that's going to give the Hajj, the khutbah, is the man that promoted amongst the people that promoted these 50 Jews that are pro-Israelis to come to Saudi Arabia. And I bet you this man doesn't know about phylacteries and he doesn't know about Jews wearing the Kaaba in their forehead. And I bet you this man knows and he has he's completely oblivious and blind. So what khutbah is he going to give? He doesn't know anything. I mean, maybe I'm extreme in what I'm saying. May Allah forgive me. But... There are more. There's more than one reason why Muslims should be crying. They're dancing while the Jews are slowly taking over. They're dancing while what? Pro-Israelis are coming to Israel, to Saudi Arabia. They have the youth distracted in their in their dancing and singing. They have the youth distracted in their dancing and singing while they are slowly playing their game and their agenda. And this man who's giving the khutbah of Hajj is part of that agenda. He's the one who's going to say, please come, we love you, you're our brothers. And, you know, there's quite a few hours of his talks and one can judge from that what he's really about.